Tonight's ten lecture, please, I apologize, I've got a cold, so I'm not uh, as uh, rambunctious as I normally am. I'm Riley Nelson, I like insects. Uh, tonight, we have the pleasure of... Uh, Attention guests to the Bee Museum, the Tanner lecture is about to start downstairs in the auditorium. Thank you. That answers several questions about existentialism and such. <laughs> Email and, and loud. Okay. Uh, I've known uh, uh, David Wagner for many years. The first time I met David Wagner, he, uh, I was a, a PhD student here at uh, Brigham Young University, and he was a graduate student, uh, PhD student at Berkeley in California. And a bunch of them got together uh, from Berkeley and drove across the uh, Nevada to come to some uh, entomological meetings in Salt Lake City. There were uh, several teams of uh, people that were to compete in a thing called Linnaean games. Linnaeus is sort of the father of taxonomy and, and so forth. Uh, these Linnaean games, those of you who might be familiar with the idea of a college bowl, no, not football, but it's a, a, a trivia for academics sort of thing. And this was trivia for entomological academics, and the BYU team consisted of me, Michael Whiting, and I can't remember who else, and the team from Berkeley consisted of David Wagner, and I can't remember any of the others, but it went right down to the, to the wire and David Wagner won, as opposed to Berkeley, uh, uh, but it was, a, it was a close match. Then. Uh, a couple of years uh, uh, after that, he finished his PhD a little bit ahead of uh, me and uh, took a postdoc in downtown San Francisco at the California Academy of Sciences uh, where he uh, studied, what do you study at the Cal Academy? Ghost moths. He pialid ghost moths. That's these moths right here. I brought the drawer, probably the, the total drawer of the, the holdings of that moth family is right here you know, from the Bee Museum. And actually, uh, these moths right here, the small ones, these are big. These are small. Okay. Uh, uh, David uh, recollected the, the first uh, representatives of those moths caught in more than 50 years. Uh, on that same trip, he came across the, the reverse planes coming from uh, uh, California. And he described them as coming out right at twilight, right at dusk. And they lived up in uh, up in uh, uh, Gamble's Oak Woodlands. And he described to me as we were talking. He said they come out right at dusk, and then they go back and forth like this. And so I went out the next chance I got, and I didn't see any. But he had caught all of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, we'd like to thank the Tanners uh, and the, the for the support they've given the Bean Museum through the years. Uh, both through the, the facility itself, different fellowships, and for this lecture in particular. David, if you could come forward. There is a, a token of appreciation from us for the Tanner, Tanner lecture. Here is this. Nice. Somebody take a picture. I mean, we've got a, a zillion pictures of everything else. <laughs> uh, David, uh, after leaving uh, Berkeley, went and did a postdoc at uh, first the Cal Academy and then uh, at Vermont, and then and now teaches and has for many years been a teacher and researcher at the University of Connecticut in stores. Uh, he has written extensively on moths and uh, books that are very valuable both to the to the academic community and the public as well, and. Somewhere along the way, he got particularly interested in the caterpillars uh, because this is a group that we all know what caterpillars turn into, but we don't know which ones turn into which. And a great deal of what David has done with his life has been to figure out how those things are related. He'll talk about that sometime. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to add 
I lived this a little bit uh, in the sense that I didn't expect uh, as many young people as I see out there uh, tonight. So um, we can try to have fun. It's, it's uh, imbued with uh, some great macro photography, uh, and that will be the caterpillars. Uh, but it, it is a research talk, but I'll try to make it relevant. And one of the major themes that I have tonight is um, why these biological collections in a natural history museum are really valuable and, and how you can use those specimens to work uh, and uh, how you can get uh, specimens. Uh, so, you know, stripped of their behavior, uh, just in the specimen drawers, they still can tell us a lot about nature, about behavior and physiology, uh, conservation biology. And so I'm going to show you two or three studies that I've done that sort of harness the specimens in collections, puts them to work. And, and I think we really want that. I think to protect the funding for natural history museums, it's really important these days to, to put them to work, uh, to digitize the specimens, to share that data, and then ecologists and data crunchers and bioinformatics people uh, can start harnessing those specimens. So that's another thing. Um, I never meant to study caterpillars. And so uh, th th this whole talk in some ways is a, a testament to how important a professor can be to a student, a special mentor, a special teacher, a door opening that you didn't expect. All you wanted was $10 an hour. You needed uh, a little spending money over the semester. And all of a sudden, it turns out to be an opportunity to laugh. And then all of a sudden, uh, you end up getting added onto a paper. And then all of a sudden, you decide to go to grad school. And, and life's like that, and, and college is like that. And, uh, so I never intended to be up here telling you about caterpillars. It was, it was an accident. It was an opportunity. It was actually a diversion. It was a side project. Grad students, uh, bless their hearts, uh, tend to get distracted. Well, everybody gets distracted, right? So um, it's, it's really fun to take on new things or uh, find things and, and take on a new project. I had a professor from Michigan State uh, asked me to do a two-page article on a group of moths and, and focus on their caterpillars. And that s started me down this vortex that I haven't been able to escape. So we will talk about caterpillars over the course of tonight. Um, I, so the, the gentleman that sort of headed me down this road is, is Fred Stair. Um, he's a Swede, and Swedes never die. Uh, he looked like that when I met him, and he looks like that now, and it's been 30 or 40 years, I think. And I, I, I only wrote this, uh, this, this very, very short article, but it just kept turning into another project. And so never, ever underestimate the, the, the importance of an internship. And sometimes I think the best internships are unpaid, because um, people are doing it because they want to be there. Um, but in any case, uh, watch out what courses you take and watch out what internships you sign up for because they almost always will end up changing your trajectory uh, on your journey on this planet. So tonight we're going to, uh, first off, how is the sound? Is it, is, do could I need be, this? could be a little louder. Okay, I, I haven't turned it on yet. Okay. So I could either project a little more or I could turn this on. Turn let, me, let me try projecting a little more first and then uh, if that doesn't work, I'll go to the microphone. So I'm, I'm going to start off real quickly just talking about uh, why uh, caterpillars or immature stages are advantageous to, to work on. Caterpillars are the largest organisms that you will see in the new world for which there is no literature. So um, you can always find a book or a field guide or something for organisms that are this big. When you're starting to get lizard-sized or a small fish, there's literature out there, and there, there's not for caterpillars. So, that's sort of been my niche, and I've really, really, really enjoyed it. But uh, we'll be talking about that. Um, I'm going to talk about some evolutionary biology in terms of uh, how we can use caterpillars to give us a window back to the past. And so uh, I think that'll be a fun exercise. Um, one thing that, that's related to this is that caterpillars and adults, they're separate life stages, and they can evolve at different rates. So adults can evolve slowly or caterpillars can evolve slowly, or it could reverse, and um, the caterpillars could be evolving faster, at least in terms of what we see, their phenotypes, uh, or what, what we imagine. And so you can get a sort of a decoupling between um, how fast appearances are changing in the adult stage versus how fast appearances are changing 
in the larval stage, but that provides taxonomists or systematists or biologists with different data sets that answer different kinds of questions. And I think that's extremely neat, and we can ask, uh, at least touch on why that might be the case in caterpillars. I'm really interested in uh, some ecological questions. So I am a taxonomist. I name species. I try to uh, infer how they're related to one another uh, and help build the, the tree of life. But I also am very much a biologist that's interested in behavior and ecology. And I'm especially interested in uh, global gradients of diversity. Why are there so many species in the tropics? And are the species down there doing different things than they're doing in Utah? And uh, I think they are, but uh, there's um, some disagreement about that. So we'll, we'll talk about that. A little bit about this cytotax under the digitization of, of collections and, and, and turning these collections into data that can be processed by other kinds of biologists. Okay, so disadvantages of using caterpillars. They're not well known. I bet you you don't have a very good collection here, uh, which would be uh, true of every state university, practically, or a private university. And there's very few really good immature collections. So that's definitely a disadvantage. The characters are microscopic, and it's kind of cumbersome to work with them. So they don't tend to get the kind of attention that I have given them over the course of my career. Um, I like them for various reasons. They are another kind of uh, data set, so we just kind of talked about that a little bit, and that um, they can be evolving at a different rate relative to the adults. Um, oftentimes, the caterpillars give you a deeper look back in time, just in terms of a, a caterpillar is a, a, a fairly uh, primitive looking uh, creature, and it would, um, it would tend to uh, be reflective of very, very ancient uh, periods in the history of, of a lineage or um, of these organisms. And then um, the adult stage oftentimes is under a lot of selection. There's uh, the males and females are courting, and uh, they would tend to be evolving a little more rapidly. Um, they, again, they might have a different rate, and so we can have the adults evolving much, much more quickly than the larvae. That can switch, and we'll talk about one, one really fun exception. I have lots of splendid macroscopic in images of the caterpillars. Um, there's other advantages of working with larvae. Um, you can study them through time. I love having them in the lab. It's like having a pet for two weeks. Um, and, uh, and it's great having a pet for two weeks as opposed to... Some pets are great for 20 years, but it's great to have them for two weeks. And, <laughs> and um, you can do behavioral observations in the lab. And uh, I, I really just enjoy working with them. But uh, they're a long lived, they're oftentimes the longest live portion uh, or the longest lived portion of the animal's biology. So you have an egg stage, a larval stage, a pupil stage, and the adult stage. And, but the larval stage is there for maybe four weeks sometimes, but that means there's a long period of time for natural selection to act on it, where some insects only live to their nuptial flight or whatever. So they're around a couple days, right? And then they're gone. So selection may not be acting on those in the same way that they would a longer life stage. So they do, they do provide lots of advantages in that way. Um, so larval systematics and caterpillars have contributed mightily to our entire classification of Lepidoptera, what the suborders are, what the families, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of how uh, larvae can play a, a really important role in sort of our classification and how we think about uh, the relationships among these organisms. Let's go to Patagonia. So we're going to go to the bottom of South America, and that's where we often find uh, relic taxa, or living fossils. So if you go to the tip of the southern continents, you go to Australia, you go to uh, New Caledonia, you go to southern Africa or southern South America, we often have these ancient uh, relic organisms. It's a really great place. It's time travel for biologists. So if you want time travel as a biologist, go to Patagonia or something like that. And you will see the same phenomena that were happening 100 million years ago or 60 million years ago, and I'll, I'll talk about why that might be the case in a little bit. But this moth was discovered uh, feeding in the southern beach in Patagonia. 
When it was first discovered, it was recognized as a living fossil or a relic taxon from the time of dinosaurs. Um, when they found this and looked at its morphology, they decided that it was a mycopterigid moth, the most primitive lineage of moths. They're still mandibulate with jaws uh, for grinding up pollen and spores, just as they had done 100 million years ago. And they listed all these characters that were found and shared between this moth and mycopterigids. And so they got a nice publication out in 1979. The problem is, just a couple years later, they found the larvae. And uh, they looked at the larval characters uh, based on the larva. And all these green characters here are larval characters. And they found out they had misclassified the moth, that the larva was actually a better data set or a better reflection of its true evolutionary history or um, taxonomic relationships, and so they had to uh, rebut their first previous, so they got two papers out of it, I guess. Um, so, um, that, was, that was a benefit, uh, but they ended up having to recant just four years later, and they created yet another uh, suborder for that moth, but uh, it was a, a way of sort of revolutionizing their findings. Uh, this is another example of how adult and larval characters can tell you different stories about the tree of life. And, this is a study of prominent moths. There's about 40 species in Utah. Beautiful caterpillars. They built a, a tree or inferred the relationships among the various genera here. But notice as you go towards the base of the tree or go back in time, there's no resolution. So the, the researcher was unable to decide how these were related to one another. Who shared a common ancestor? But when you looked at the marble set, which is much fewer characters, um, there was actually resolution all the way back. So this is this, I this, is this idea that if you look at caterpillars in mature stages, you can get a, a, a deeper window in the, into the path. So this is what I do. I mostly work on books. I'm working on a guide to Western North America now, and I'm hoping they'll treat a thousand species, and I'll get back to that at the end of the lecture, uh, hopefully. Um, but I just finished this, uh, this Eastern work, and along the way, um, all these other little projects uh, sort of spin out. And one, this is one of the reasons I like working on the books, is that um, they often generate daughter projects that uh, have stories of their own that become relevant. Uh, this is a new cryptic species that I discovered just a few years ago. And it's interesting, but they really sh this will show you the utility of looking at caterpillars sometimes. The new species are here. This, this is a, these are the new species, and this is what it was confused with in collections. Um, I can't tell them apart. So we sent the uh, specimens off to Canada to be dissected, and uh, this is the new species. This is the old species that it was confused with. I can't tell them apart. We found no morphological characters outside or uh, on the inside. We actually got some DNA data. And so the new species was here, and very, very similar to uh, the one that was confused with here. Uh, basically, the differences were too insignificant for a scientist or biologist to say it was distinct. But I knew it was distinct because it was eating a different plant. And then we had the caterpillars, and here's what the caterpillars had to say about this dilemma. So. This is our new species, and this is the uh, species it was confused with. The caterpillars are abundantly distinct. This caterpillar stays uh, put, it's very well camouflaged on its plant, and has tiny little legs. And that's because it stays put 24 hours a day, it feeds just in one area of the plant. This guy is, look how big the legs are here, by comparison, almost seven times the size. And this guy's a commuter. He rests on the bark by day, and at night goes up to the top of the tree, and then as soon as it gets daybreak, comes back down again. So this guy's commuting 100 feet a day, and this guy's commuting one inch. And, and because of that, we were able to use the, the caterpillar morphology to uh, make, some, make some inferences about uh, a new species to science. Uh, this is just sort of a fun story, and, and, and sort of talks about the dilemma of, of the literature about caterpillars. This is a caterpillar I found on the shores of Lake Michigan. 
There was no literature when I started. So what I did is I sent pictures of this off to the Smithsonian Institution, and I sent pictures off to an authority at the New York State Museum. And the guy at the Smithsonian was absolutely certain that this caterpillar was Coma chondra cadverii, and the guy at New York State Museum was absolutely certain that this caterpillar was uh, Polygramma hebraicum. And I said, I called them both back. I go, Are you both sure? Because the other one, the, the other authority, and they were both sure. And, and that was really bothering me because these were in two different families. This was a tiger moth, and this was uh, an owlet moth. And so the caterpillar shouldn't have been the same. And so I started to get a, a window into what was going on when I found eggs on this plant. It was black gum. And this caterpillar grew up to be the one on the shores of Lake Michigan. And as it went through its last instar, I was amazed that it actually could change its color three times during the, the course of its development. We always think about change happening during a molt. But this species would be green while it was eating on a leaf. And it has this very special blue, black, and yellow morph. And then uh, once it was inside the cocoon, we'd get a red a red morph. And so this is um, amazing color changes, even within a single instar over a course of just four days. But I think the amazing thing here is that this caterpillar can change from this phenotype to this phenotype. And I'll show you what's going on and why this one might be adaptive. And that what's going on here is that blue form is a bar, uh, is evolved or selected specifically for tunneling. Do we have a movie going here or not? I don't think this movie's going to work. There we go. So this is a cryptic color form. If you're a green caterpillar on a leaf, that's fine. But if you're a green caterpillar on a piece of bark that takes five hours to bore into to make your pupil crypt, it doesn't work. And so natural selection and probably birds are driving uh, the appearance and the evolution of a whole new behavior. I don't know if you saw this guy flip out this uh, soccer ball, but that soccer ball is going to be important. So there we were. So the guy at uh, the New York State Museum was right, and the guy at the Smithsonian was wrong. <laughs> and that's where it stood. But I, I wanted to find out how the guy at the Smithsonian could have been so wrong, uh, because he was a, a very respected researcher. So I decided to try and egg the thing that he thought it was, and so I egged a female, and I reared this caterpillar, and it looked exactly like the other green caterpillar. And I said, well, what the heck's going on here? And it even went through this same color morph at the, at, uh, at the pre-pupil stage. And so I started looking at these things side by side, and I became convinced they must, be, they must have shared a common ancestor. And uh, so even though this was classified as a tiger moth in one family, and this was classified as an owlet moth in another family, the taxonomist had missed the boat. And the caterpillars had the true story. And they rolled the soccer balls. And that was it. To me, that was a lock. I mean, as far as I was concerned, this is a... You see a certain behaviors and certain phenomena in nature, you think only evolve once. And, and to me, this was one of those, uh, those aha moments. I'm like, this just doesn't happen. Uh, I, I, you know, I've reared 2,500 species of caterpillars at this point. It only happens in these. And so I, I moved um, this moth out of the tiger moths, and I put it you know, in this group with, with the uh, owlet moths. And I, I had pretty good, pretty good evidence for that. And it was really a fun story for me. The giants of my, of, of my field had, had got it wrong many, many times, basically. <laughs> and so its taxonomic journey was uh, a long one, but it, it had been classified in three families and four subfamilies in 70 years. Uh, but the caterpillars knew what they were all the time and uh, revealed their story to me, and, and so that was kind of fun. And I didn't mean this to happen. <coughs> you won't mean a lot of your scientific discoveries to happen. They just show up on your front doorstep. And, this is another, another situation here. This is a bird dropping moth. It was unrelated to the other two. Um, but I noticed in the lab one day, as it started to pupate, it rolled soccer balls. And I'm like going, this can't be happening again. And uh, we, we followed this story and uh, with morphology and uh, even a little molecular data. 
this other, now this other caterpillar that was uh, our species, Cervus syrinta, that was again classified in a different part of the tree of life, uh, turns out to probably be a relative, and uh, all, all three of these, so this is um, this, this Comacara, this, it's called the Hebrew, I guess because of that, like the, the scribbles on the wing in terms of the, the lettering, and then this bird dropping moth, all of them shared, appeared to share a common ancestor. So the, the taxonomists had really missed the boat on this, but, but it happens. And so when I first started, uh, these, these, uh, I found four of these groups that were uh, involved in this behavior. And I can show you a nice little movie clip here. I think this will work. There we go. But you, you'll get to see the, uh, the soccer balls in this fourth genus. When I first started, they were classified in, uh, in different parts of the tree of life, and I brought them all together uh, into a single group. There, there it goes. Let's flip it out. <laughs> and so we, you know, that's not going to be enough to, for me to get a peer-reviewed paper. Uh, so I had to uh, garner more evidence, especially since these two uh, uh, look so remarkably different. So. We started looking at the larval anatomy and we found that they both shared this gland on the neck that they shoot uh, defensive secretions out of. They both have this uh, really unusual scale cup on the abdomen. And so we were able to uh, put together a pretty convincing argument that these should be classified together too. Here's the tunneling behavior and they even have the same threat posture where they rise up and uh, splay the legs. But this I think is just to expose that neck plan that I showed you in that previous scanning electron micrograph. So if you harass this larva a little bit more, you're going to get a shot of acid uh, out of the neck. Probably not so bad for any of you, but it's not it's uh, bad for birds and that's, uh, small mammals and, and the like. But what I really like about this story, and, and sort of um, harks back to what I was saying about going to Patagonia, is this whole taxonomic reshuffling that I did and the whole line of inquiry was all precipitated by a behavior. So um, we, we think of behaviors as, as being sort of plastic. We all have very plastic behavior. But it can also be a relic behavior and it can be a window to the past. And so my entire research agenda was actually catalyzed by behavior. And so, um, behaviors can be preserved for millennia. I think I told you that the most ancient moths that evolved about a million years ago are still eating fern spores and pollen grains in the same way they did a million years ago. Things, animals get a ticket that's working and oftentimes it stays. And, and so that's why I think it's very, very real that if you were to go to New Caledonia today, and, and walk through a forest there for an hour, you would be going in a time machine back. And so many of those insect plant associations and many of the behaviors that you see of those animals are locked in and they've been sort of locked in for millennia. And it's very, very exciting. And it, it, particularly when you can go back to your office and have these insights as to how these different animals or the plants and animals were interacting uh, over, over millions and millions of years. Well, one thing that was uh, problematic about putting all of these uh, four taxa into a single, I was saying that they shared a single common ancestor into a single taxonomic group, um, it, it created a couple problems. One is that by bringing in this, this one species, uh, Surma, it eliminated all known morphological characters for the family. So we, we like to have taxonomic groups that have characters that we can recognize. When I moved that one in, based on ball rolling, that became the only character known on the planet uh, by which held them together, which is a pretty lousy character. We don't always know what the characters are that hold things together, but um, at that point I was sort of forced to uh, go out and get molecular data, uh, because there was no, I, by bringing it in I had eliminated every character that you would use in a key to, to identify, or anything Riley would use to, to write, correctly place an animal into a collection upstairs. So we started getting some uh, molecular data. Uh, and the first 
uh, 15 years ago, about all the molecular data we had was what's called a barcode. It's on one of your mitochondrial genes. You have millions of copies in every one of your cells, and it's becoming the universal standard for identification of animal species. So you, we get this barcode, this one, uh, it's like 658 base pairs for every bird, every mammal, every frog, every bug, and we can use that as an identification tool because everybody can collect it. It costs you about 15 bucks now uh, to, to do it. And I was just saying at dinner, if uh, some powder comes into a port in you know, New Jersey, somebody can check and find out if it's rhino or or something like that, and then that becomes a big deal, or if, if it's ivory or something like that. So the first data we got uh, didn't group all four of the uh, moths together. It, the, this one, uh, uh, Harrison Mimic trisignata, came out in a different part of the tree completely, uh, which, which was a, a bit bothersome. Um, it came out in, right here in another group unrelated to the other three genera. I didn't like that. But because I thought that, I really thought that this ball rolling was important, but at least in terms of the first DNA we got, it was going down here in another part of the tree, and I thought that it belonged up here. But I was uh, pretty uh, pretty sure of the fact that the DNA had to be telling the wrong story. But it was only one gene, and we have you guys have about eighteen thousand or so that are coding for something. But I was, I was banking on the fact that this uh, certainly could have only evolved once, and it was sort of a globally unique system. This is the guy that has started that barcode system that I'm talking about. For every animal species on the planet, we're going to get this one gene, so we have a standard. We have a database that you all can use. He was pretty sure that, he, that his gene was doing the right thing. So he, he was uh, berating me. Uh, about my ball rolling and my soccer balls, and uh, he had this to say. He says, one day, Wagner, you're going to wake up and ask yourself, how could I have been so stupid? And then he said, Dave, uh, make that our wager a, a, a case of soda. So we had had a bet, and uh, he made it, he went from a six pack of soda to, um, to a case. <laughs> so, and so he's, uh, we're actually collecting the DNA there, we're taking the legs off of moss, and uh, they would be sequenced over the course of two months. Uh, these are, these are the, uh, the characters that we're thinking about at this point. So I did a more sophisticated, figure I'd do a more sophisticated analysis. So the first sophisticated analysis I did was a better, a better tree building algorithm. My, all four of my genera came, all my ball rollers came out together. And I was really happy. Um, <laughs> but the problem was, that there was really no support for this branch. It was a, a weak branch. So I decided to do some sensitivity analyses and try some more um, permutations, but particularly substituting what are called different out groups. And every time I started looking at it, uh, my, my group was getting kicked out now. And so he was, the, the Canadian barcoder was right, and I appeared to be wrong, but I still wouldn't accept that. So at that point, we decided we were going to have to get nuclear genes to answer this question. And we did, and the nuclear genes are unequivocally in favor of ball rolling evolving only once. So, so this is the, the nuclear genes now, um, and the ball rollers come out um, in, in a single cluster uh, down, <coughs> down near the base of this tree. So I've been redeemed and I'm still waiting for my soda. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so some of the advantages here is that, uh, in this case, the caterpillars and their behavior really uh, provide a window into the past and let me get the taxonomy right when the morphology or the appearance had misled some of the greatest fathers of taxonomy in my field. So it was really uh, a, a satisfactory outcome. But I, I like the fact that behavior uh, underlying underlies this whole discovery. So I'm going to do the opposite now. And this should be fine, at least for the kids, because I'm going to have some nice caterpillar shots. Okay? Um, this is the opposite situation, where I'm going to take a group of moths, and I'm the accelerated or the informative 
uh, rate of evolution is going to happen in the caterpillars and the adults are going to evolve uh, more slowly. So, I'm sorry, the, the, the adults are slow, the larval clock is fast. These are Acronicta, they're daggers. There's about 20 species in Utah that have fabulous caterpillars I'm about to show you. Um, but I can't sort these very well. I know Riley can't, and as Sean's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is, every institution in North America, including the Smithsonian, has this group of laws sorted in different ways. So they're just hard. Uh, you, can, you can dissect them, you can get it right, but it's a hard group. And here they are. But uh, the only people I know that get excited about these moths are people that collect too many moths. <laughs> they, they really are uh, kind of mundane, but their caterpillars are absolutely fantastic. And uh, so these are some, some pictures, mostly from my uh, eastern book, but if I see any western species, I'll point them out to you. But a lot of these will occur in Utah. I would say about 10 of these. So um, this, I'm going to take you, this is all just one genus. So I don't know if you have a, a, a concept for what a genus is. So uh, a, a wolf and a dog and a coyote, they're all canis, right? Okay, so that's a genus. So that's the kind of variation that you're looking at. Um, can't think of it. You know, I can't think of another good genus. But and generally, things are fairly constrained within the genus. It's a group of species that uh, appear uh, somewhat similar. But these caterpillars all belong to those ugly gray moths. But this is four different species, and four more Acronicta. They're all over the place. This is four more Acronicta. This is why my books sell. <laughs> this is for more acronyta. And here's for more acronyta. And now what I'm going to do is show you um, a set of six acronyta that are actually mimicking other species. So this is the idea that from a single common ancestor, I can go out and I can go into the phenotypic or morphological or ecological spaces of six different families of moths. So this is one genus. But it, its larvae are going to look like the larvae of six different families. And that's to show that there's this really rapid rate of evolution, at least among the larvae. So some acronicta look like uh, tussock moths. This is an acronicta that looks like a prominent or uh, a nododontid. Uh, this one looks like a tent caterpillar. This one looks like a tiger moth. And, and so it goes. Um, there's another set that I didn't pin here. They also look like um, uh, slug caterpillars as well as uh, the, the pus caterpillars. But this is the situation that, that we're seeing in Acronicta. These are very, very similar moths. I think most of these actually occur in Utah. And these are their caterpillars, but abundantly distinct. Um, these two in particular are confused in collections, but the larvae, if you have them, uh, you'll never get wrong. I wish there were a way to, to measure this phenotypic evolution. If you guys know of a way to, to actually measure this relative to measuring this kind of change, I would like to compare it. I, I think you'd make a, a, a very nice quantitative study. So um, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, through these <coughs> summary points. I think that we've had a chance to discuss a lot of this stuff. And it's basically it, talking about the utility of larvae and using caterpillars in systematics and in evolutionary inference and classification. What I want to do now is talk about how you can use the kind of biology that I do and how we can use caterpillars to answer big questions. Uh, things that matter to all scientists or anybody who's interested in biology and conservation biology and that sort of thing. So uh, we'll start off with this idea about uh, diverse <coughs> specialization. So caterpillars can be used as a proxy uh, for all ranges of ecological and evolutionary phenomena. And one that's getting a lot of attention right now is how specialized the diets are of caterpillars, so their relationships with their host plants. And the issue is, are tropical <coughs> organisms more specialized than temperate organisms? Are the caterpillars in Utah more generalized than the caterpillars in Ecuador? And I could say the same thing produce rodents. Are diet threats in Utah the same as they are in Peru 
or are they more specialized? The reason that becomes important is we know there's a lot of species as we move towards the equator. But it's part of that because these species are interacting with each other in a special way and becoming more specialized. And because they're more specialized, they perceive the world in a more fine-grained fashion. There's more niches. Um, life is more, uh, more complicated. And if that's the case, then um, that would explain why we see this gradient from Utah to Costa Rica and then into Ecuador. So there was a paper by Novotny uh, looking at this very question. And he found that, at least in his study set, he did this in, uh, I guess, Czechoslovakia and New Guinea, that if he had a group of tropical trees and a group of temperate trees, and he looked at how many different host plants are consumed by caterpillars in Czechoslovakia versus New Guinea, that it was roughly the same. And basically his idea was that these caterpillars are specialized, mostly specialized in the temperate zone and mostly specialized in the tropics, but there was really no difference. And I don't believe that's the case. And I believe his study set was too small. Kibaki was claiming that they're basically the same. These are the tropical caterpillars here, and then the temperate caterpillars are in an uncolored bar. And then it's basically a similar pattern. But you can see a longer tail with these, these temperates, suggesting that they may eat more different kinds of host plants. And so we did a large meta-analysis across uh, seven different sites. And we, we definitely disagreed. His paper is published in Science. Ours is published in Nature. And um, I, I can tell you the jury's still out. It's a very, very important question. But we are using the caterpillars and, and my data to sort of get at the fact of whether or not our organisms in Utah are more generalized than those organisms that are living in Costa Rica, and those are more generalized than the ones in Ecuador. And what we're seeing, for example, uh, when we plot out um, at 60, this would say to be the number of host plants eaten at 60 degrees at the Arctic Circle, we see a fairly broad diet breadth, and as we move down to 40 degrees, uh, what's your latitude 39. here? You're 39. So you get to here, the, the caterpillars are eating about uh, 2.5 hosts per caterpillar, the so 2.5 2 different host plants. As we move down towards Ecuador, it gets closer to 1. So our data is suggesting that part of the reason there are so many species in the world is because where you get a lot of species, everybody gets more specialized. And they, they have, but I don't know that we're right. Um, this is a large meta-analysis. Uh, the data is not as clean as it could be. Ecological data is hard. Getting data from the tropics is hard. But it's a very important question. So this is, this is the same sort of thing here. Um, this is the idea that as, if you move from one plant to another plant, what's the likelihood that you're going to have a different species? And um, what we found in our data set is that when you when you go Connecticut and you walk from one tree species to another tree species, you have low species turnover. By the time you get up to Ecuador, um, it's at lower latitudes. So at lower latitudes, you get to Ecuador. Every time you uh, go to a different species, you're probably going to be uh, getting a different kind of category. That sort of thing. So this is uh, just a way of plotting species turnover. Lower in Connecticut because these things are generalists eating lots of plants. Uh, by the time you get to Ecuador, every time you get to another plant, you're going to get a different caterpillar plant. So we're, we're continuing to do these maps. And these, these maps, this is what you would call a food network, or even in basic ecology, uh, these are the connections between species. And so these are the, the, what these are eating. Imagine that this is a bird species, this is a bird species, this is a caterpillar species, this is a caterpillar species, the orange balls are caterpillars and the red balls are plants. And so these are the, the trophic, this is the community. This is how these things are related to one another. Who's eating who? We're really interested, I'm really interested in seeing how these change from Utah down to the tropics. This is going to be our data. And so I'm continuing uh, to collect this, this kind of information. All 
I want to talk a little bit about cyber taxonomy and some of the stuff we're doing now. I just got back from an expedition to the Amazon where we're, we're building an electronic field guide. So it's, it's great to go down to the tropics and collect. Every biologist wants to go down to um, New Guinea, uh, maybe go to Ecuador, uh, collect in the tropics. But what happens oftentimes is we bring our specimens back and we put them in our institutions. And so there will be some in Connecticut, there will be some at BYU, there will be some at the Smithsonian, there will be some at the California Academy of Sciences. And imagine the poor Latin American who wants to get involved with dragonflies and damselflies or taxonomy, and they have all these specimens all over North American institutions, and it's almost impossible for them to have the money of the time to visit. So we've got an electronic field guide project where we're trying to digitize our specimens. We actually take a flatbed scanner into the jungle, and scan our specimens uh, with li essentially living colors and then get them online. Uh, so uh, people in Costa Rica, democratizing science in, in a sense. Um, I might be able to visit this website. Yeah, there it is. So this is all online and we can um, go see these things. And it's so fun because the, actually there, it's almost more fun to go to the website than just they're like huge. Uh, you can see every freaking, you can see every freaking spine and all the wing venation, and they're they're you know on the grandeur of your big screen. If you have a 25 inch monitor, that's like eight times bigger than the insect. So so it's absolutely spectacular uh, to be to be able to see these animals uh, essentially with, with living colors. So uh, my, my next book, I'm working on this now, this Western Caterpillar, I'm hoping that it'll be somewhat of a, a cyber uh, a piece of a taxonomic resource, and then there's going to be a paper copy, but there's going to be a Kindle version, and then that will be bundled uh, electronically to a, a thousand page um, deeper volume with much longer species counts and many more images and that sort of thing. So. I'm about 700 pages into this Western Guide and uh, enjoying that. And I'll have some images to share with you uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, another way, I, a project that I've been involved with is we've databased a million bees. And I just want to talk about what you can do with the specimens in the collection here if you database that specimen and then you uh, amalgamate the holdings from various institutions and you can start to ask big questions. So this is just a, a project that I've been involved in with the American Museum and six other institutions. And we've uh, now databased close to a million bees. And um, about 23,000 records came from Connecticut. But you can use all this data, the collection data. Um, the way we, we actually did this is students, undergrads mostly, uh, fed them, collected the data and put it into um, a web portal. So they just filled out this form uh, for each specimen. And then each night, it was uploaded into Discover Life. And uh, this is an example here of uh, just, uh, one of our, our specimens. So we can go to Discover Life. We're actually going live now um, to the site if this works. If it takes more than a minute, we won't do it. Uh, but we should get a map shortly. And we can actually drill down to the actual data. So if we, let's see if I can do this. We'll see if we can drill down to one of my specimens. It's a little slow, so I may not, I may not do this. But all the data for every specimen can be retrieved from doing. Let's just try this. There it is. There's my specimen yeah, in in the database. But we've done this for a million specimens now, and. I can show you that we've got two papers in the proceedings of the National Academy at this point, and we've used this, the data to inferences about climate change and make inferences about the conservation status of bees. So uh, one thing that's, if you're interested in climate change, uh, we have data from harnessing specimens, dead specimens in collections about climate change. So um, this is the average um, date of emergence of spring bees. So the bees that come out in the early spring, we picked about 12 species, and then we went in and looked at what time they were coming out in the spring. And historically, from when we first had uh, records in collections until we're getting them today, 
they've advanced about 10 days. So uh, at least in New England, uh, they're hatching 10 days earlier than they used to. Uh, just by the, uh, by the way, uh, Thoreau used to keep uh, a notebook of when flowers were blooming at Walden Pond. They're blooming 10 days earlier uh, than they used to be uh, in Thoreau's time. These, this is uh, the, the temperature increase over this same period. And so you can see that uh, April temperatures have been coming up and the bees are hatching earlier. This red line uh, just shows the changes in the lab. The black line is a change since we started keeping historical data. But if you know anything about climate change, it's been accelerating since 1980. And so this red line is uh, what's actually happened in, in just the last 10 years. And so they, things are really starting to hatch earlier. So much of the effect is happening just since about 1970. And this is a, another plot where we're looking at these dead bees in collections and asking them big questions. And this is what's happening to bumblebees in North America. And bumblebees are in decline. Not all bees. So it's, it's not always a bad story. So most of our bee fauna, and that's pretty si significant in New England, it's 300 species. And so most of those things are still intact. You still have good pollination services for your flowers and fruits and vegetables and nuts. But um, at least the bumblebees are taking a hit. And so that, that's what the, uh, this decline is, is a number of uh, bumblebee species. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here, but this is just uh, other data that we extracted. It, it shows that specialized bees are going, are declining more than generalized bees. And that's sort of what we expect on a, on a general biodiversity. If you guys care about biodiversity, specialized species or species with complex life cycles are in trouble and we're getting more and more weedy species. And um, so in that previous, that previous slide, this is the, uh, a plot of new or invasive species. So exotic species are on the rise. They're on the rise in every continent. And things that are specialized, complex life cycles tend to be um, disadvantaged. Over. And, and so in this other plot here, it would be the idea that specialists are doing poorly, and also bees with large body sizes. So larger organisms always tend to be more imperiled. They need larger home ranges. They need more resources. They need more enemy-free space. And you add all those things up together, and sometimes it's not good to be a large species. So that's um, what I have in terms of acknowledgments. I think I, I would like to share some images from my Western field guide. So uh, this is what I'm... I'll just finish up with like a few images from my Western Field Guide and we'll take some questions or something like that. So, uh, this is my passion and um, I think the animals are fantastic in a lot of cases. It, um, it's kind of like the opposite of the ugly duckling story. Um, the caterpillar is way better than the adult. <laughs> uh, this, this is a, a really fun one uh, that I discovered last year. But the larva actually, um, as it ages, it tracks, genetically tracks and matches the flower that it's feeding on. And so when it's young, it looks really similar to a young sunflower. But as it gets old, it loves seeds. And so uh, as it switches to being and maturing on those seeds, it becomes much more dry disc flower-like. And so here it is here. And, but uh, my books always have a vignette that teaches about natural history, or about conservation, or about taxonomy. Uh, these are some of the caterpillars that I just saw. It just came from the Super Bloom in Anzabrago Desert State Park. And these are some of the images that I took, and I thought I'd share them with you. They're fantastic creatures when you blow them up. <laughs> so um, one of the lessons, maybe the most important lesson I can take to, to all of you, you or, or, or transmit is that if you look at nature one order of magnitude um, if you magnify one order of magnitude it's a whole different universe and so even flowers become absolutely gorgeous with a hand lens or your your digital <coughs> camera or you turn your binoculars upside down but one order of magnitude will change every walk you ever take the rest of your life these animals are not spectacular when they're this size. And um, a good example of that is every once in a while you will see a caterpillar that's brown. If you put it under your hand lens, you'll find out there's not a bit of brown on the animal whatsoever. That's your brain filtering. 
and processing information. It was purple, it was yellow, and it was orange. And at a meter's length, your brain turned that into brown. Uh, but I always carry a loop when I'm in the field, but uh, digital cameras are, are wonderful in terms of uh, changing your journey. And there's just a tremendous amount of beauty, not just in bugs, but I would say flowers. Uh, the details of how the pollen is packaged and the bison threads and, and the styles are really worthy of our attention. Well, I don't know how this happened. I don't know where we, let me uh, scoot. This is a really pretty swallowtail. Beautiful flower, uh, I call it an indigo bush. A threat posture, not very threatening when it's a caterpillar, at least us. Uh, here's another uh, really handsome. So it's going to be a beautiful work. I think it might be my most beautiful field guide. I mean, these are, I don't know if they're, they're, they're prettier than mammals. I hate to say it. <laughs> but maybe not as pretty as some of the lizards. And uh, the fish are fantastic. Uh, but they're, they're really extraordinary animals. And it's amazing that we don't have names for a lot of these things. But um, this is a beautiful, one of your spring orange tip butterflies and marbles in, in Utah. And that's a, a, a fantastic. Uh, orange dip butterfly, desert orange dip butterfly. So it's been really, really fun for me to work in. You know, when you magnify things, you see things you'd never even expected. So, for example, um, you're seeing something really unique here, and you wouldn't know it until you magnify it, but every one of these CDs ha has uh, a gleave of something on it, and I bet you anything that, that has something to do with ants and uh, sort of preventing wasps and, and ants and uh, other things. But you don't get to see that stuff unless you magnify it in order of magnitude. And if you go to a microscope, you'll see another order of magnitude, and it'll be a whole yet uh, different level of discovery. So uh, there's a lot out there with biology. I think that might be it. Okay, thanks. Uh, the decline of the honeybee has uh, uh, been studied by maybe 500 people at this point. It's really important. Our national economy is somewhat geared to the honeybee. It's, it's like we all know that we want a diversified portfolio, and we do not have a diversified portfolio for pollinators. So um, the, the honeybee is, uh, I think the almond industry is almost 100% uh, dependent on the honeybee. So, um, my answer, my short answer on, on the honeybee is it's death by a thousand cuts. So that's why it's taken 500 scientists um, and they haven't been able to come up with the right or the, the sole answer. So it's uh, two species of exotic mites. So what, what's really going to change our world are pathogens that move from continent to continent. That's what wipes out the American melon. That's what wipes out American chestnut. So it's, and, and we're missing four species of bumblebees in the United States right now, that's a pathogen. Pathogens are, are complete deal changers uh, for, for biotic diversity. But anyway, it, it's quite probable that the two mites, uh, maybe they have a host of viruses. Um, we're feeding them fructose and artificial things in hives, uh, which may not actually be the best for their immune systems. And um, any number of other factors. Now, there's a lot of pesticide in in, in the honey and in our environments. And so it's, it's not, the pesticide is not necessarily causing a lethal uh, exposure, but it's weakening the immune system. So that's, those are five things that I just named, or maybe more when you consider all the viruses. So it's death by a thousand cuts that makes honeybee colonies very, very vulnerable at this point in time. And we're looking to change that, and I don't know how we can, but good, they do know that really good hygiene in those hives uh, uh, eliminates most of the problems. Yeah. So I know that like American Dollar is a sport farmer, and so like he can just wait around until the conditions are right and whatever. Right. right. That's the water, but I mean, if the honey is so important to our economy, why don't they just try to like genetic engineer to be able to do that? Because it's so many things. I mean, it's a, a lot of it's multiple viruses, and it's two mites, and so and 
And um, I, I don't think that our biotechnology is even is not. It's definitely not there yet. We don't. We can't bioengineer to be resistant to mites. Maybe viruses. But yeah. So in many of those pictures that you showed, some caterpillars have. Uh, defensive structures like hairs or other things. You had some notes about some of those, but then others were very cryptically colored. Do you see a trade-off between sort of those two ways of avoiding predators, or are the things that are really cryptically colored are they good? Do they, do they taste nasty too? Or, or is I, I almost gave that talk. I asked yeah. if, if I could switch. So I have another talk on. The defensive strategies of catacombs, and it's like there's two DAOs. There's two ways of being a catacomb. So, the, the deal is if um, if you could dig naive birds, and if naive birds would eat those, we'll call those palatable caterpillars. And um, if our naive naive birds will never eat these things again after they've eaten one of these things, those are the unpalatable. So we have palatables and unpalatables, and they have completely different rule books. They um, they eat different times a day. One eats at night, one eats their Clint Eastwood. They don't care, they eat whenever they damn well please. Um, one is a messy eater. Uh, they don't care how they, they don't care if they're messy. The other one is always neat. It never leaves extra stuff that birds can see. Um, uh, so it changes everything. And so the, the cryptic ones are cryptic and the ones that are protected advertise. They want, they have to educate all the birds. And so they, they want to do it efficiently. But and they use the same signals that Gila monsters and coral snakes <coughs> and other bad things use. So they use orange and black and yellow, um, and, and oftentimes accentuated with white. They don't call them bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I noticed in the paper today or yesterday there was a, a big article or an article saying that the first. Um, bumblebee is now on the endangered species list. Have you seen that? Right, I'm upset about that because I was actually going to be sampling for bees with bee bowls, which drowned all the bees to sample them, and now I don't know that. I mean, I have funding to do a bee bowl study. I don't know how that's going to happen. But anyway, this is a bee. It was a, it was a familiar bumblebee, is uh, Bombus affinis, and it is all but extinct. And you guys in the west, uh, west side of the Rockies, have lost two. And we've lost two essentially on the east side of, uh, east side of the Rockies, and it has to do with this uh, as a pathogen from uh, a protozoan that was. Uh, bumblebees do great jobs. Most of the tomatoes you guys eat in the winter time are pollinated in hot houses uh, by bees, and and so they grow these in Europe, and then they ship the bees over to our greenhouses, and you guys get to eat tomatoes all winter long, and it's great. But uh, when they brought the bees over, they had a pathogen. And then there's bees, there's a pretty high escape rate, like 3% of the bees get away every generation. And they got into the wild bees. And uh, so certain bumblebees were susceptible and certain ones weren't, but this was one of the susceptible ones. It, it, so it, it actually made the list. I was hoping to say it within the last two days. That's unfortunate for me. but. It's unfortunate, even more unfortunate for the bee, but I mean, you're going to be seen. <laughs> well, maybe there's a caterpillar. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. Um, you mentioned that the, the question was brought up about honeybee mm -hmm. colony collapse and things like this. Um, and you mentioned diversifying the portfolio. Wouldn't it be cheaper and easier to modify farming practices so there's fence rows and woodlots and we recruit native bees and wasps? that can do some of this pollinating that That's now we, rely just yeah. on honeybees. Yeah, so there's a, a there's a pretty big push, I, most of my grads did that at this point, across universities too, to look at pollinators and, um, and, and plant in different ways that uh, would, there's a lot of wild pollen. I don't know, Utah has a fantastic uh, wild bee species. Thousand species. Thousand species of wild bees. So to have one your, species of honeybees. And it's introduced. Uh, from, from here. So, um, there's abundant opportunities to use wild pollinators. Um, and it will work for certain crops and maybe not work for other crops. But we certainly need to diversify. That's, that's clear. And it might be a lot cheaper. So, definitely looking to do that. Yeah? Is there bee trend data coming from collections? The bee what? Trend data? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is from, you know, we have a special. 
advantage in New England. We've had entomologists there for uh, uh, 150 years. So, I mean, that really gives us a, a historical view on what's happened that, that uh, other states don't necessarily enjoy or get to take advantage of. But still, there's lots of big science questions that can, can be answered with this kind of information if you get it database and make it available to people. And, um, too, too many messages about biological collections. We don't even know how our specimens will be used in the future, but there'll be, we haven't even thought of all the questions that we can answer with biological specimens. But if they're not in the collections, then we won't be able to, to, to ask the same questions. I mean, just think of the amount of toxicology that could be done in uh, the future based on a little bit of leg tissue that was left on a mouse specimen or something like that. There's, it's almost infinite. When, I mean, and everybody's talking about the microbiome and that all of us and every animal is a, an amalgam of bacteria and uh, protozoa. And, and in many cases, uh, these are really important to the animal's ecology. Its immune state at any given time, its ability to uh, fend off other trophic levels and what have you. All of that would be, or a lot of that, will be in the specimen, in the collection. And without specimens and collections, we won't be able to have that historical data. So, it's, I mean, we don't like to shoot birds anymore. We don't shoot birds anymore. But I think it's actually lamentable that we won't have bird tissue in collections uh, in the future, particularly for species where hunting or taking a few museum specimens would make no difference. Um, so it, we, we sort of got to the point now where we, there are not that many people collecting bird tissues. And I don't think that that's actually the, I don't think posterity wants us to do that. I think they would actually want us to, to still collect bird specimens in a cautionable way uh, and, and make sure that those tissues and those DNA samples and those microbiomes were going to be there in the future uh, for future generations to ask good questions. Yeah. More specialist in the tropics was your hypothesis? I and, think. And less and more generalist? as you move away from the tropics? Is, is that, am I hearing so, that? Uh, probably the easiest way for me to say it is that caterpillars in general, by breath, will increase as you move away from the tropics. So that means the average caterpillar will eat one species or a few species in Amazonia. They'll eat uh, a, a small handful of species in Costa Rica. In Utah, they'll eat 10 species. And at the Arctic Circle, they're probably going to eat anything they can get their, hand, their mouth around. Um, but that's, the basic idea is that things become more generalized and that biotic interactions, just dealing with other animals and plants is a really big deal in the tropics. And as you move up to, from Utah north, it's the climate that becomes the overriding driver in sort of what you do and who you are and what your niche is. So were you using just trees? You kept saying trees. Were you... We were mostly using trees and woody plants because they're the most reliably identified and the most reliably sampled. But it, it should hold true uh, for, for forbs and other plants. We don't have that data. Okay, so my, my question is, is many times when you get specialized habitats where conditions are more harsh, uh, sometimes we get more specialized species because it's so harsh and to adapt to whatever plants are available, yep. or, or specific kinds of plants and climate, deserts in particular. So, I don't know, would, have you brought that into it at all, the fact that there are different habitats, different climates that are very severe, like a desert or a cold climate or a high mountain climate, yes, that, rather than a, just trees? Or That's a finer scale on the question. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, my data and our data suggest that deserts do have very specialized niches because they're so stressful. And, and another thing with deserts, that leaves are very expensive for plants in deserts. They tend to be chemically protected. And so they're, um, it's not like eating lettuce when you go to a desert and start eating food. So you're absolutely right. That, um, a really stressful environments also have specialized faunas. But on the other hand, you saw 125 species blooming at the same time out on the desert last week, or this week. Yeah, I had pictures. I don't know where they are. Oh, God, I went to, I, I was going to share some of the super cool pictures with you guys. I just got back from Mandalay Borrego. But so it's very diverse. I mean, it, uh, there was 125 species of uh, flowers in bloom in Mandalay Borrego um, this week. Yeah. Well,
And, uh, no, it's actually Sonoran. It's south. Of, it's a little lower, and that's why you would go there during the spring break. Um, Mojave is a little higher in elevation, and would be peaking about now. And for the next, you have another week uh, for the Mojave. Um, okay. Any other? I'll, I can stick around a little bit uh, afterwards if you have any other questions. But thanks for coming. Thank you very much.